So you're kind of like the first century church. Yeah. You know, I heard a story this week about, let me get to the right spot here. I heard a story this week about a plane for Everett Airlines. Anyone hear this story? They flew 13 hours only to land back where they started. I've been there. <laughs> I've been there. Who else has been there? It reminded me of a story in the Bible where Philip, consumed by the Holy Spirit, gets to go from one place to the other without having to travel at all. The, the United Emirates Airlines flight went 6,000 miles only to accomplish nothing. And the Holy Spirit took Philip 18 miles without him having to do any effort. Yeah, 
guys. Someone's excited. I'm gonna get a little weird on you guys this morning. I don't usually go too weird on all this stuff, but I am really a weird Christian, to tell you the truth. And it's in simple terms, the Holy Spirit can bring you farther in five seconds than you could go in your whole lifetime. I think everybody believes that. There's more that can be accomplished in one second with the Lord than that can be accomplished in a lifetime of counseling, therapy, anything, you name it, self-help books, you name it. One experience, one encounter with God can change you forever. We know it. One encounter. Yeah. Those of you who have had that encounter are cheering. Yeah. So I'm looking at Hebrews 12, verse 22, and it says, By contrast, what it's talking about here is in the Old Testament, Moses and all his boys roll up on Mount Zion to meet God, and they're scared. Oh my gosh. All they see is lightning and thunder, and they're freaked out, and they have no ability to be in relationship with God. But when Jesus died on the cross... He invited us into relationship with God, and we're no longer scared of him as long as we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. So what it's saying is it tells that part of the story that says, by contrast, we have already come near to God. You're already near to him. He's already there with you, whether you realize it or not. In a totally different realm. Wait, not the natural realm? No, the Zion realm. For we have entered the city of the living God. You're already there. There's already something going on around you that you guys don't even realize is happening. For we have entered the city of the living God, which is the new Jerusalem in heaven. And here's the part I really wanted to touch on. <laughs> we have joined, past tense, the festal gathering of myriads of angels in their joyful celebration. Right now, in this very moment, you have two realities in front of you. That which you can see with your own natural eyes. And it's kind of cool. I mean, we're having a good time. But there's another reality going on around you that you don't even realize. There's a party. There's a, a myriad means countless. A almost unending number of angels partying around you right now in realization that you carry the grace of God in your life to have an encounter with him in this very moment. So I want you guys to, to close your eyes right now. And for those of you who are like, I don't know what he's talking about, it doesn't matter. You don't have to understand what God has already done for you. You don't have to understand what's going on. All you have to do is say, I want an encounter this morning. I want you guys to repeat after me, I want an encounter this morning. I don't want to leave here the same. I want to worship God from an encounter on a feel the presence of the Holy Spirit move me this morning. I want to enter into a place of time with God that I have never experienced. Who's with me? I want to realize that I'm living from the Zion realm. I'm ready to lay it all down. I'm ready to lay it all down. I don't need to understand why I went through what I went through. I don't need to have a, a, a pun. I don't need to get punished for the sins that I've committed. I don't need the shame and the guilt to tear me down anymore. I need to just enter and live from the place that God already paid for. He's not concerned about your past. He's already paid for it. In fact, you're already there. You're already in the Zion realm. All you have to do is just ask God to open your eyes. Are you guys ready to lay it down this morning? Yeah! Are you guys ready to lay it down this morning? Yeah! I'm not done. I, I really want you guys to understand what I'm saying. Just enter in. Just enter in. Right now, close your eyes again. Lord, we just ask right now that, that those, those that are hungry could be filled in this very moment. Lord, that even a mustard seed of faith right now would enter into their heart and they would begin to start feel you moving. That the traumas of the past, the frustrations of, of, of the past, the fears of the future would just melt right now in this very moment as they realize the things we're going through are temporal, but what you've given us is forever and everlasting. It can never be taken away. You can, you'll never abandon us and you'll never leave us as orphans. Lord, right now in this moment, I just ask that the Holy Spirit can move in this place, that the Holy Spirit can start to turn hearts in this place, that you can begin to have an experience with the Lord, that the presence of God will be so powerful and, uh, and overcome over you that you can't help but just worship the Lord. Yeah. Father, thank you. Thank you. I want you guys to start speaking out. Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. There's so much stuff in your life you don't deserve, but it's the goodness of God that's poured it out on you. Start thanking him for it from a heart of appreciation. Tell him how good he's been to you. Tell him how much he matters to you. Speak it in your own words. Tell him you love him. I love you, God. I love you, God. I love you, God. I want more of you.
you. Cry out for more of the Lord right now. Cry out for the fact that you don't deserve what you got, but it don't matter because he's so good. He's so good. He's so good. Tell him how good he is. Tell him how good he is. In your own words, tell him how much you love him. Don't stop. This is a holy moment right now, and you don't want to miss it. I've been thinking about this moment all week. I've been thinking about this stirring all week. I know God's moving right now whether you feel it or not. It don't matter what you feel. All that matters is the truth. And the truth is God loves you. And he called you. And he wants you. And he made you because he wanted you. And he's not going to abandon you. He loved you with his whole heart. He looks at you and goes, wow, you're beautiful. You're everything that I desired. You're all that I need. Let that just reminisce over the top of you. burden and every crown this morning it's time to lay it down it's time to lay it all down at the lord's feet Here is where I lay down. Yeah. sing it out this morning this is my surrender we go this low to go high you surrender to go high you surrender to enter into the lord's presence I don't carry it anymore
that delivering and that healing, right? So I want you to bring to mind your friends, your family members, those people who we're still contending for, right? We're still contending for and sing it on their behalf and just stir it up in your spirit to hear the sound of those dry bones starting to rattle, those dry bones starting to come to life. Prodigals coming home. Here we go. My God is able to save and to live. Yeah, nothing impossible. And restore anything that he wants to. Nothing impossible. My God is able to save and to live. Hallelujah. And restore. might feel like a little bit of a left turn, but you guys can have a seat. Wow, wow, wow. Wow, wow, wow. My God is able to heal and deliver and to save. We're going to take communion this morning, and the communion we're going to take is in remembrance of that in remembrance of that healing and that saving and that deliverance. Um, at Living Word Chapel, we practice a couple of things that are different, different than what you might have experienced. You know, we just, we just saying that I will make room for you, shake up the ground of all my tradition, break down the walls of all my religion. How many of you have ever had like a religion experience of communion? a ritual experience of communion, right? We've all had it. And even for those of us who have been in like this circle, like I've lived in this beautiful in this beautiful community for gosh, 35 years. Hard to believe because I'm only 35, right? I mean uh, and even then it can become a habit. It can become a ritual. But I really want to I want to teach you about a couple of things in regards to communion today. And the first thing is that we practice an open communion here. This is, this, is the, this is the body of Jesus given for all of the world. Do I have your attention, everybody? I know we kind of are busy in this room. This, this body of Jesus is given for all of the world. In Luke 5, he says, who goes to the doctor except for the sick? You don't go to the doctor if you're well, right? He says, who goes to the doctor except for the sick? 
And in the same way, I'm gonna just pull up my notes. And in the same way, Jesus came to call sinners and bring them to repentance. How many sinners in the room? <laughs> All y'all, that's me too. He calls us to come to repentance. I heard somebody say one time, you know, when you're fishing, you don't catch clean fish. Right? You just catch them and then clean them. Right? Jesus calls all of those who need repentance, and that's all of us. So we practice an open communion, which means that you don't have to have it all together in order to take this communion and just praise God for that. He's not looking for perfection. He's not looking for performance. He's not looking for us to strive for acceptance. He just wants our heart. The second thing is that we practice, we, um, practice um, an open communion in terms of kiddos. We don't expect our kids to have gone through a class in order to take communion. So I'm going to ask our kids to come on down like we do every, every week. I'm going to ask all of our kids to come down. If you're carrying your juice, walk gently. Yeah, don't mess up the carpet. <laughs> All of our kiddos, come on down. If you have your communion, hold it out in front of you. Turn and face everybody. <laughs> I do want some, yes. I'm just not sure how. I know. If evolution was real, moms would have three arms. <laughs> All right, Julie. So we practice... We, we say that um, it is up to you, moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and guardians, to determine if your kids are ready to take communion or not. You know, a lot of times I think our kids receive in a simplicity that we as adults have overcomplicated. They understand that this is the blood of the Lamb, that this is the blood of Jesus, that this is the body of Christ. And so if you guys would extend your hands to our kids, you guys are going to sit with your moms and dads or grandma and grandpa, whoever you came to church with today. You're going to sit with them to, to, to take communion. You're going to sit with them while we take communion. But I want you guys to go ahead and extend your hands to our kids and just bless them. Jesus, I pray that as they receive communion today, that they would come to know you at a deeper, more intimate level. We just thank you for the simplicity of their hearts. You know, kids believe nothing is impossible. We thank you for the simplicity of hearts. And teach us to be childlike. You know, Jesus said, let the little children come to me, because theirs is the kingdom. Amen. Theirs is the kingdom. So let us learn from these kids of how to be childlike. All right, Cadence and Bryn and Callie and Caleb and Judah and Zadrian and Ben and Savannah. Go find your responsible adult. <laughs> Sit with them. Now, on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, he broke it and he blessed it. You know, how many of you know that Jesus knew when he was breaking the bread, he knew that he was giving the example of what he was about to do in his own physical body. He knew that the bread, he said, this is my, this is my body, and he broke it. He knew what he was doing. You know, and then Paul says that I, this message was handed down for Jesus. Jesus handed down the message as he handed over his physical body. He broke it and, he said, and blessed it. And then he took the, the cup at the, end of the, at the end of the Lord's Supper. He took the cup and he gave thanks. He knew that that blood was, that that cup was his blood. And in the pouring out, he gave thanks. There's something that I'm discovering about communion as of late that, you know, the first, the first sin, the first introduction of sin in the garden was the enemy convincing Adam and Eve that they didn't have enough. And so truly the first sin was ingratitude. When Jesus took the cup, he took it, he said, I'm going to pour everything out and I'm going to give thanks for that. That's that hard thank you. 
That's a hard thank you. How many of you are in moments where you're like, man, I'm finding it hard to find a thank you in this? That's what Jesus did. He took the blood and he said, here it is. Thank you. He knew for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. So when it, I think it's Psalm 103, I think it says, forget not all my benefits. Why is that? Because in the middle of those really hard times, it's super easy to forget. But Jesus gave us this example. I'm going to pour it out, and I'm going to give thanks in the middle. So if you have your bread, go ahead and hold it out in front of you. The broken body of Jesus. It was blessed and passed down. And as we take this bread, we remember your sacrifice today, Jesus. We remember your sacrifice, and we eat the mystery. (laughs) Just like the Israelites eating manna. Manna meant, what is it? We eat the mystery. It's manna. So we take in the mystery of the body of Jesus, and we give thanks. Go ahead and receive the bread. And then he took the blood and he gave thanks. Right now, Father, we we stand in our moments of our difficult thank you. We dig deep for that hard thank you. For the joy set before you, you endured the cross. And then you teach us to not forget your benefits. So even in the moments of these the squeezing moments, these difficult moments, these confusing moments, the times where I don't even know how You're working it out. I choose the hard thank you. Just like you taught us to do, to take the blood and to choose the hard thank you. Go ahead and receive. Amen. Amen. All right, moms and dads, you can go ahead and check your kiddos into Children's Church. Bless Karen, bless Sean as they go and teach today. For those of you who don't know, we're kind of in a, if you're new around here, we're in a little bit of a different season. Um... Pastor Sean is taking the next eight or nine weeks to teach in Children's Church and to help get some some things established back there. Um, and so for last week, we had a panel talking about Romans 8. How many of you were here? It was so good. Some of you were here via Facebook Live. Hello, Thad. We see you. We love you. Um, and this week we have an, our next panel and our conversation today is about worship. I think you guys warmed, you primed the pump really well. <laughs> you primed the pump really well. So our, our conversation today is about worship. Dancing around the chairs. And then we've got some upcoming speakers, so you just watch the schedule. We've got some really great um, people coming to be our guest speakers in the next few weeks. Next week, we have Mama Pam Rieger. Fiery, curly-headed, redhead amazingness. Um, She'll be next week. Next week is also our pancake breakfast, so come early, get some pancakes, and then come listen to Pam Spitfire. Um, this week we have all of our regular weekly events, our, our Monday night Bible Blitz with Bruce. I heard this week was really, really, really good. I didn't, I heard it was really good. Um, we have our Saturday morning men's revival group. And then Thursday nights, ladies, we have a Thursday night call, um, and we were doing a book study. We're done with that book now, so we're in a bit of a transition time. So if you haven't checked it out yet, this is a good time to join us Thursday nights. All of those links are on our on our um, Facebook page and on our website. What else? February 17th through the 19th is the Came to Believe Midwest Retreat. <laughs> if you have not yet signed up, see um, Pastor Sean or Jenny Bunny. She's not here today, but um, talk to somebody. We'll get you hooked up if you want to go. We'll get you hooked up. It's actually almost sold out, so don't wait. Um, and the Women's Breathe Conference is coming up March 17th through the 19th. No, 17th and 18th, so sorry. 
Women's Breathe Conference. We're still kind of working out the details, but this year we're going to be going in person. We've done that. We've done that um, conference virtually the last several years. We're going in person this year. Um, so if you have any questions about that, see Mona or myself, and we'll get you details about that. What else do I have here? Oh, Rebecca Lyman, would you come up? Do you want to tell them a little bit about what you have going on? <laughs> so Thursday, I'm going to head out to Uganda, Africa. Yeah. yeah, I've been there. This will be my third trip. I haven't been able to go the last couple of years because of the pandemic. But anyway, I'm going there to uh, assist a doctor from New Zealand who's been there for nine years. He's given up his life for the, for the rural people of Uganda. Those people were... Um, their lives were turned upside down for 20 years by uh, Joseph Kony, and some of you might have heard of the invisible children. So these are the grown-up invisible children who live out in the rural areas trying to live on their farms and they don't have health care close to them and so this doctor has set up little clinics. He has 36 of them now. They only cost $3,000 to set up and that's the medicine, the salary for the nurse who runs it. It's really quite efficient and amazing. He takes the top 30 diagnoses that the World Health Organization has for every country. So you can see what everybody dies from in every country on their <laughs> website. And so he takes the top 30 and has the medicine there at that little rural clinic to help with those common diseases. So I'm going to help them educate the nurses and open another clinic. Yeah, so she leaves Thursday, right? Leaves Thursday and then comes back. It's a couple of weeks. But she misses a day in there and travels, so we can't figure out what day she's coming back. But she'll be, she will be back. So you guys extend your hands. If any of you actually want to come lay hands on her and just speak protection and blessing over her trip, thank you, Jesus, for Rebecca. I just thank you so much for who she is to our community, for all that she does um, to bless us in, in this community. And I just thank you, Jesus, that you've given her a heart for the people of Uganda. And I, I thank you, Jesus, in advance that you are covering her trip, that you are covering and protecting every second of this trip, that as she leaves to go to the airport, as she boards the plane, she's not going to fly for 13 hours and go nowhere. She's going to get where she's supposed to be. She's going to get where she's supposed to be. It's going to be smooth. It's going to be blessed. It's going to be fun that she is going to be covered in health and protection from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. And Jesus, I just thank you that she will be spreading the love of Jesus through her healing hands and through her education just around the globe. We're just so grateful that the little ministry that we have here at Living Word is going out from here through the hands and feet of Rebecca. Anybody else want to pray for or bless? Yeah, and her husband says bring her back safe. Yes. Yes. Amen, amen, amen. Yeah, thank you. Pretty exciting stuff. Pretty exciting stuff. All right, so I'm going to have our panel members. Hi, Chris Lyman. You're on the panel today. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Chris is not going to Uganda. He's going to be holding down the fort. <laughs> oh, yeah, Chris goes to jail. He can't leave. Oh, I'm sorry. I always forget offering. We're supposed to, every week I forget this, Terry. Do you want to talk about offering? <laughs> Since everybody always forgets, we won't mention any names, but it, it, it's... We want to give you the opportunity to give to God, and we know a lot of times uh, people, we have the baskets up here, but to get them handed out and stuff, a lot of times it gives you another opportunity to give. We never, we, you know, if you want to give, we certainly want to let you, but thank you all. You know, just looking over the church financial situation, we're in great shape again, and, and that's thanks to your giving and your generosity. And when I look and see, as I'm analyzing the finances, the amount of giving, that we hand out, we give out from this church, it's amazing as the percentage too. So give yourself a hand, okay? 
And now get ready. That was a weak hand, man. <laughs> Okay, they're writing checks, getting their money out. Reach into your neighbor's billfold if you want. That's one thing that Pastor Randy always used to say. And you can be a lot more generous then. But thank you all. God, please bless the people who give today. Bless the money and make sure that the leadership of the church puts it to the best use possible to advance your kingdom. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Just uh, further encourage at least one of you, if not many. He was talking about whether you knew how to do it, how to like give, surrender, commit, whatever. Um, I just I thought of Gideon, and for those of you who don't know, what Gideon was he, uh, he was a captive, a slave. He was hiding, and he heard the voice of God say, "Hey, Gideon, mighty warrior, get up!" Yeah. And he said. Mighty warrior, I'm from the small, I'm nobody, I'm nothing, I'm from the smallest tribe, and I'm hiding right now. And you're calling me a mighty warrior. And then this is this is where the money is, so this is what you guys need to hear. And I remind myself sometimes, and I need to, God said, you know, take what faith you have, just take what you have. So, obviously, Gideon had just said that he didn't have much and wasn't much. But God said, just take what you have. Yeah. So that's, that's good for all of us. That's good. Well, we'll go ahead and start our panel discussion. They'll get the microphones figured out. You know, I always, I always like to say this, that nobody knows or pays any attention to the people in the back unless something isn't going right. <laughs> the only time we think about the some people or the PowerPoint people is when there's a mistake or the microphones are ringing. <laughs> so uh, so uh, we just give you grace and patience. <laughs> You'll get it figured out. All right, so we're going to go through a few questions that um, we kind of prepared ahead of time that we I hope is going to spark some conversation today. Um, and we're going to talk on the topic of worship. And so we're just going to start with the first question. 
And um, if you have any questions or comments throughout our panel discussion this morning, Alicia will be fielding those. So just raise your hand and she'll bring you the microphone. We want you to for sure be on the microphone so that the people on uh, Facebook Live can hear your question um, as well. So whenever you have a question or comment, just go ahead and raise your hand and Alicia will help you out. Um, so our first question, and I'm going to let Bruce answer the first <laughs> answer to the first question, is what is worship? <clears throat> what is it? So as I was selected for this panel discussion, much to my chagrin, because I'm not a worshiper like we just worshiped. Worship that we just had, I'm in the back room cringing because it's too loud. <laughs> so when I was going through what is worship, I get my books out, I get my music out, which has been called by my wife, funeral music. <laughs> but that, that, that oh yeah, oh yes, that's awful. All my key stuff, well it gets me fired up. <laughs> So when I was doing that, I was looking through my books, and the Spirit of God says, what are you doing? And so I'm looking up what it means to worship. He says, you know how to answer that. Worship to me is any activity right. that brings me into the presence of the triune <coughs> God so I can have fellowship with him and worship him. Yes. It might be raking leaves. Yes. It might be making bread. It might be scrubbing no. toilets. It might be in the break room of my work. They can fly I'm hungry. I wish I had pizza. And 30 minutes later, here comes off over pizza from a, from a company out, outing. Thank you, God. Yeah. That's what we're, we're worshiping me. So I want to I want to be in a place where I can worship Him all the time. And if there's an environment that takes me out of that worship experience, I move to this place where I can. That's good. So. That's good. Chris, do you want to give an, your answer to what is worship? Worship, worship is it's, uh, honoring. It's um, it's a form of adoration, veneration, consumption. I would say. So uh, worshiping, worshiping really, it's 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 really it's absolutely not about us. But it, what what's more is it's a response. Worship is a response, and so. You might want to think of it this way, if you can, and sometimes we sing about it, if you, if you have any gratitude for the living God and what he's done, you will worship. Because it will be a natural response to the gratitude that you have. The other part of worship is, uh, and, and that's what hallelujah means, because halal in Hebrew means exuberant praise. Yes. So that's worth knowing for some of us who say that word. Yes. Exuberant praise, and um, and so I mean, it, there's a lot. There's a lot to worship. We could spend all day. I'd love to. It's my favorite topic. It's because it's vital. So much happens during and through worship yeah. for us. You know, it's for it's for God. It's an expression to God and for Him. But there's something that happens in, to, and through us during worship. And and I'm talking about praise and worship mainly. But Bruce is right, you know, every act can be a, 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 every act, everything can be a situation of worship. Because worship means to like, it also means to like bow down. And, and that's an act of veneration, yeah. an act of honoring, and an act of humility that you are God and I am not. And another thing, another reason for worship <laughs> is uh, because he is worthy. The world, the world is the Lord's and everything in it, you know, and he is the spotless lamb, the only one worthy to open the seal. He's, he's the pearl of greatest price and absolute worth, and because of all those things, he's the one that is worthy of our attention, our affection, our adoration, and our consideration. And if you want some more, we'll talk later. <laughs> I was going to um, add to that that worship, so worship, like the definition of worship is to adore or revere something. And so the truth of the matter is that we can worship anything that we focus our attention on. <laughs> it is the meditation of our heart is what is actually what we're worshiping. If I'm giving reverence to, weight to, um, adoration towards, or just over, uh, like, emphasis on a thing, I'm mean, actually worshiping it. So that's why, you know, if, if my heart, my affection, my attention, my focus, my thoughts are focused on money, 
My worship is actually of money. If my if I'm giving reverence to, if I'm getting, putting weight towards or emphasis towards a problem in my life, I'm actually worshiping that thing. Right. And the Bible teaches us to worship because we become like that which we behold. We become like that thing which we like adore or model after. <coughs> so God knows, like Chris just said, it's t- to Him, but it's for our good. Because he knows that my best good would be would be to be like him. And so to worship, to give that adoration, it's, it's exactly like Bruce said, it can be at any time of any day. And should be at any time of any day. That my focus, my what I'm giving weight to, is to the king of kings. And not these other things that tend to take my attention or affection um, or meditation. And the, the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall worship nothing else before me. Just like mm-hmm. Libby was saying, we worship money, we worship power, we worship power status. We need to worship God. Everything else will fall in place. Any comments or questions? <coughs> right off the bat? Are there a lot of Biblical references to worship. Yes, there are. I'm glad you brought that up, Tim. Exodus 3:12. Exodus 3:12. It's pulled out of the heart. But God said, "I will be with you, and this will be the sign of you that is who has sent me. When you have brought the people out of worship or out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain." Next one, Job 1:20. And this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. He fell on the ground to worship. Next one, Matthew 4, 11. In all this, I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now, in those three verses, there's a theme. Who's getting the worship? And who's getting upset that they're not getting the worship? Yeah. Moses was worshiping God. Pharaoh didn't like that. Job was worshiping God. Satan didn't like that. The Son of God was the Son of God. Satan didn't like that. So when we worship towards God, there will be some kickback because somebody's not getting their back scratched mm-hmm. in a modern vernacular. Last, last one, John 4, 23 and 24. We, we beat this one to death, but God gave me a new revelation one week and a half ago. You the time is coming and has now come when, we worship, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and the truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and the truth. He was talking to a Samaritan woman who was getting water at high noon. And I could, I could, if you were there watching this scene unfold, you can see the Samaritan woman, her eyes just dropped and said, worship God? How can I do that? Because worship back then was in the temple. You went to the temple to worship. What Jesus is saying is, as long as you are a spirit and truth, you can worship me anywhere. So there's a few that are Christian, some more Daniel and the, and the, three, the three friends. But again, worship... We're fighting against Satan because he wants his worship, but we're worshiping God, which is the greatest power. And we can worship him anyway. Yeah, and that verse that John, John 4 verse, uh, in the Passion Translation, <coughs> um, to, the, he's seeking worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Um, for, God is, for God is spirit. In the Passion Translation, where it says God is spirit, it says God is breath. Which means if, if he's looking for me to worship in spirit, he's actually looking for me to worship in my breath. <laughs> Which, by the way, you're doing all day, every day, even when you're asleep. Yes. Which means that I should, that at my every breath, he's looking for my every breath to be my worship. 
There are lots of, yeah, there are lots of, the other thing that I think is really fun about some of the references in the Bible um, about worship is there are times where they say, they, uh, like Habakkuk talks about a shagayanoth, which is just like that crazy wild what we did this morning, that's shagayanoth. <laughs> um, it talks about like them using the tambourine and the lyre and the, the lyre is a guitar, pretty much. Yes. Uh, it talks about using shouts of and sh the trumpet what blazing, you know. Um, I think that's why we often get the word worship uh, confused with what we do in praise and worship um, because it gets titled as something that's like a, a genre of music. But worship is not just the genre of music. It is in our every breath. But the Bible talks a lot about make a joyful noise, make a sound in worship. Over 1,500 verses are dedicated to worship on the entire Bible. Yeah. So it's a big part of the theme of the Bible. Um, the reason why I ask that is I sometimes believe when we're up there we have to be careful what words we use you know what I'm saying because I, I, I don't want to push anybody in the wrong direction or sometimes I feel like when you're worshiping that you're responsible for leading other people and it's a big responsibility it seems like to me you know what I'm saying so if I go up there in the wrong frame of mind or the wrong heart you know it, it, I guess that what I'm saying is it's a big responsibility in any form of of servitude, I believe, where you have to uh, really make sure your heart is right. Um, sound people, can I just make a suggestion that we just cut these mics and make it simple so that Kristen can join us? Okay. Are we okay? All right. Can I say one more thing? Please do. Uh, okay, so this is what I believe. Uh, <laughs>
they see him, they fall down. <laughs> and that's been going on, was, is, and will always be. And uh, you'll do that too someday. Amen. All right, let's move on to our next question. So our next question, part of we have some core values at Living Word, and one of them is that we believe that worship is a lifestyle. So what does that mean to you, Bruce, that our core value is that worship is a lifestyle? I mean, I think we've already kind of touched on well, that. Well, like I said, because worship is, is it can happen anywhere. So we're, <laughs> worship, can happen, worship can happen sideways on an overpass on a Friday. When we almost got a building. So then on the way back, the roads are much better. And I asked my wife, what's 7 times 24? She says 168. Wow. There's 168 hours in a week. And, we, and modern Christianity has devoted two hours to a Sunday morning service. 1.19% thinks they can get by by just worshiping God on Sunday. That's not going to happen. The diet's not going to go well if you just say you can come to a Sunday morning service, be filled for the entire week, and then come back and do it again. Worship is an ongoing, never-ending worship with God. Yeah. For me, when it's, it's for me, it's temporary sometimes. Like, you know, you get kind of like this radio down. You turn it, you know, oh, I got it clear, and all of a sudden it goes out steadily. For me, that's my relationship with God. And I want to maximize that as much as possible to have that radio clearly tuned in so I can hear it and give him worship back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I clarify that 1.19% is the two hours that we worship during the week, that is 1.19% of our whole entire week. That's crazy. I use a calculator. <laughs> today, it would be that, to remember that you unlock the gate of heaven with a password of praise. There's your key. Praise. 45 degrees. <laughs> Don't lean forward. Don't lean forward. The, uh, especially in the Old Testament, you know, the whole Bible is good. And this says this in the New Testament, by the way. The whole Bible is good for teaching and rebuking things. You can refer to the Old Testament. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But in the Old Testament, um, the, uh, 
when you talk about any kind of worship, a lot of times it talks about, most times it talks about a sacrifice. And this can get kind of tough because uh, we think of, tough for me anyway, maybe for some of you, when we think of this surrendering, I, I don't like that word, and, uh, and sacrifice, I don't necessarily like that word. But you know, um, he, he, he gives us beauty for ashes, and really all this stuff that we're hanging on to is really just ashes, and he gives us, he trades, we always trade up with God no matter what. But the point of, but the other, getting back to worship, the point is, is that sometimes it does require, just like it did them, it does require some sacrifice. True. Yeah, and you know, and so maybe some of you and I have to get over this thing of sacrifice and maybe lift your hands. <laughs> that might be a that might be a sacrifice to, for some people to do that, you know, to to look a certain way or to you know to submit in a certain way or whatever it might be. Maybe to sing that that might be tough. That might be a sacrifice. But I'm here to tell you that just like throughout the Old Testament, um, you know, whenever there's a sacrifice to the Lord, he he comes. He comes to, to consume that sacrifice. And you'll find out that he will give you beauty for the ashes. He will, you will be traded up for that thing that you thought was so tough yeah. to sacrifice. You know, it's pretty amazing. He's good. He's always good, though, especially that. Yeah, because, I mean, think about that. What if we only did what we wanted to do? <laughs> That'd be pretty boring. <laughs> what if you only did that? <laughs> if we only did what we wanted to do, we'd be pretty pretty lazy humans, probably. And so sometimes coming into a time of praise and worship, I don't feel like it. I don't feel like it. Inviting Jesus into a moment when, in that moment that, of the story I just shared, that doesn't make sense. But when we, when we choose a sacrifice, we choose something separate from what we feel like doing or what seems to make sense in the moment, that's the sacrifice Chris is talking about. Because it's not my will anymore. We need a mic on Brad, please, staff. I thought you were going to bring the hard question. Yeah, you're not. <laughs> God said, "God says, put on a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness." Yep. Yeah. Sometimes it does take our commitment to just step in, even if we don't feel like it. You know, because sometimes I get here and I'm like, "Yeah, okay." What? I'll do this. <laughs> well. You've never been that way? I don't know. Maybe I'm once. the only one. I did once. I did once. <laughs> so Angela gave me this piece of paper. There were two verses she wanted me to share. Uh, Luke 4, 7 in the NIV is, if you worship me, it will all be yours. And Luke 4, 8 in the NIV says, Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Yeah, that's good. And again, I just just to remind, remind, I mean, we all keep kind of talking about coming here and worshiping, but that's not the point. <laughs> Worship as a lifestyle actually starts when you leave this building. Yep. That's that's when it starts. This is just like, you know, training camp. <laughs> because how many of our friends have ever been in church service? Right. The only church service they see is you walking into your place of employment with a smile on your face when all hell is breaking loose. That's the goal. <laughs> First time I had worship was when you invited me to be here on the phone. Mm -hmm. And then I came. I didn't even know who you were. The next day, I figured it out. My face was When your dad answered me, Oh, yeah. Are you the one that lived across the street with the German shepherd? Yeah. But worship, I've been doing it ever since. You know, and you, you just 
Second thing you did well. <laughs> I'm listening. I'm listening. Second thing you told me was greater is he was in you than you in the world. Yep. And that's my favorite little prayer as well. It comes right out of the first of the gospel. Lord, I say that so much every yep. day, all night long, all the time. Yep. And I think that's great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, so what Dave is talking about is he, he called he called the, the church. Maybe I shouldn't tell you this, but if you call the church, it auto forwards to my cell phone. <laughs> uh, and so I answered, and it was middle of lockdown, or we were just coming out of lockdown, I think, COVID, whatever. And he's like, I don't know, should I come to your church? I said, give us a shot. <laughs> right? Give us a shot. Yeah, and then we come to find out that he actually grew up across the street from my dad in Milwaukee. Like, how weird is Milwaukee. that? Milwaukee. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Dave was saying, just made a really good point. Worship doesn't mean you have to sing. That's right. right. That's He's that's using right. worship by saying that verse over and over because that's the verse that God gave him. Yep, that's right. Yeah, the greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. That's my breath. That's worshiping in spirit and truth. Yeah, it's good. All right, guys, our next question. Chris, you have to go first this time. Oh, phew, good. Catch him break. picking on Bruce. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Maybe not. Why do we first. Our so next so question so is, so how so. has the act of worship impacted your relationship with God? Oh, I jumped yeah. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it's everything to me. It is everything to me. I think uh, I'm just going to put a little addendum on what you're talking about today, Ben. It's, uh, you know, it's it's just like the first psalm, meditate on him day and night, and you'll be like a tree planted by the streams of water to bear fruit in the season, and your leaves don't wither. Meditate on him. Meditate on him. Think about him. I think it's step 11. It says conscious contact with him. It, uh, it might mean seeing. It might mean thinking. It might mean praying, whatever it does, but it includes him. And uh, and I take it, I take I take a lot of what I say pretty seriously and pretty personally. And um, so worship is a response and gratitude. So I hope I am the most exuberant worshiper that you've ever met because I am grateful. I am grateful. Now it's my turn. How has your act of worship impacted? How has the act of worship impacted your relationship with God? So, uh, we've been talking about a lot of this in our Monday night class. We have access to the power of God. He, he is the ultimate power in the universe. So, if we don't worship Him, how are we connected to the power source? Or not. Because of my worship in the last few weeks, I have done stuff in the natural world that I would have never done six months ago. But through my continuing to worship God through my studies, knowing who He is, preaching to myself while I'm leading class on Monday, saying He is all powerful, it starts to affect you. So, little things that happen at work. And he tells you, you say this to this person. Okay, I'll say that to this person. Yeah. I was shaking like a leaf for half an hour after that. But God gave me the power because I knew he had the power, and I believed it so I could say it. Yes. After that, the, the, the roadblock is hopefully released. We'll find out tomorrow. But without that worship connection through how I worship him, I would have never done that. Yeah, and you know, I think it ties into what we talk about quite often about our declarations, the words of our mouth, you know, the word of our mouth and our meditation of our heart. You know, if I'm going to say, because you are good, good, oh, I can't say those words and not change my mind. <laughs> and that, my, what I think changes my perception. And so I, the words of our mouth, so when I talk about the act of worship, now we're talking about what we do in a moment of worship, that act of worship it changes something. It's like, because it, it, it causes a physical response to 
and, and words to come out of my mouth that have to then affect what I think and how I engage in that relationship. So that's why we don't sing songs of like, you judge me, you're mad at me. <laughs> you know, like we don't sing those songs, right? I don't do, maybe those songs don't exist. I hope they don't. If they, if they do, we wouldn't sing them. Not in our church, no. But, but it's kind of like what Tim referenced a minute ago is we have to be really careful about uh, there are some songs that here we don't choose to incorporate because the words don't accurately reflect the nature of God that we believe that he is. Um, or even, uh, well, I won't get into the nuances of it because there's some things like some people get funny about the song that says, my fear doesn't stand a chance. Well, you don't own your fear, so you can't claim your fear. So we're really careful about the words that we sing because it really does start to impact what our perception of God is. You have a question, comment? I had a comment about how uh, God is our father and our parents have us do things when we were growing up, like brushing our teeth or going to bed and getting enough sleep, that's good for us. And wor he he requires that we worship him because it is so good for us. Yes. Great for us. Right. Yes. Yep. Mona has Mona has a question or comment. It's kind of a question and kind of a statement. I know that we were created in his image. Not just his image as he is. God has power of creation when he speaks. Yeah. I know that when I worship, I consciously know that the words that I'm speaking are what I want in my spirit. There are things that we say, that we do in worship. I, I feel like we should be seeing manifesting in our lives more because we have that power that he gave us, the power of creation. So why isn't it happening? Why isn't the healing happening when I pray? Why is, why is fear still overcoming people? Why are why am I saying I surrender all and I still have stuff that is not yeah. happening? <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's it's the, I believe that growth comes in dissonance. It's like the second we see the dissonance, the dis the disconnect between okay, I'm saying I surrender all, but I'm actually kind of still holding on to that one little part. Well, then that's when the Holy Spirit gets in there and says, well, what about that? Can we can I have that too? And he lets us choose, but it's the question is the question the comment is is true. You know, I think that when we're speaking these words, it has to override, it, or it starts to override what's actually happening in our everyday, and it uh, that's where growth comes. It that dissonance of like, well, you said on Sunday morning I surrender all, but on Tuesday afternoon you're looking like a whole lot of control, <laughs> right? Right. Now, what do we do with that? So through, through worship, we trust God. Right. The more we tr worship, the more we trust God. The more we trust God, the more we can give up to God. And the more we give up to God, the more we're able to reflect his image to others around us. That's good, Bruce. The, the other thing, too, is, is that... Uh, we, we talk, preach, and sing a lot about identity, and that's that's uh, pretty significant. And so a man thinks, so he is. So when we think that we're not there, we're not there. Kind of. <laughs> but we're there, because we're seated in heavenly places. Right, right, right. What do you mean? I'm seated up here right now. Well, I'm seated in heavenly places, and he's given us all things. I mean, the Bible goes on and on. Paul especially talks about on and on that we have. We have all these resources already. So what do you believe? Do you believe you don't, and you can't, and you won't? <laughs> so a man thinks, so he is. So it's the identity part is, is who you believe you are. Yes. You it. Yeah, it is, it is part of worship, and it's part of agreeing with the truth. I mean, we can agree with things that aren't the truth, too. 
And uh, as soon as you do that, we do that quite easily. We do it too easily. But, uh, you know, he's the word of truth. He's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. Yeah. So when you agree with that, you get all that. That's true. Right, Loganberg? <laughs> right, Loganberg. <laughs> all right, Loganberg our last question, we'll, and then we'll start to wrap it up. So our last question is, why do we express ourselves the way we do, specifically individually, in your times of worship? Why do you express yourself the way that you do? So for some of us, it's it's minor chords oh, yeah. in, in, in funeral marches, funeral marches in, in silence alone. And for some of us, it's kneeling. For some of us, it's raising our hands. For some of you know, it all looks different. So Chris Lyman, why do you express yourself in worship the way that you do? <laughs> he doesn't like the question. No, I, it's confusing to me. You know, it's like, I, I mean, why does our, why does anybody, I mean, we do, we're individuals, mm -hmm. you know? So we can, we can worship them individually. And uh, as long as we do it in spirit and in truth. So I might, I might be uh, hiding in the corner and uh, I do that for a reason, by the way. Um, so why, why is it? Because you, you asked, so I'm going to tell you. Yes. <laughs> because. That's uh, that is you know praise and worship to me. It is like the purest form of of adoration, and uh, you don't want to be you don't want to be proposing to the one you love and have someone be like, hey hey, uh, you know what I mean? You want you want you want a you want a moment of intimacy, and you want a moment of purity. That's good. And you want a moment of togetherness. And uh, so that's 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 what I want, and um, that's what I'm going for, and that is the that's the the best the best thing in life, and we were created we were created to know Him and to worship Him, and we will do that forever. Um, that so that's that's what it is for me, and uh, it might mean. In, it, it might mean a few different things, a few different ways. It might mean shouting one minute, crying the next, uh, yeah. singing the next, whatever that is. But um, yeah, so it's a it's an intimate and it's a personal thing, or it can be as much as you want it to be. That's good. Yeah. And to clarify the question too, and part of it is I've learned from my kids. Sometimes my kids ask questions of like why we do something that is just second nature to me, right? Like, why do you, why do you raise your hands? Oh, I don't know. I guess I've never even like thought to explain that, right? Or have maybe some of you even experienced that you come, you came to Living Word, and you're like, why are they doing that? Why, why are they? What are they doing? <laughs> why are they doing that? So that's the that's part of the the. And so I loved your example of like the the intimacy of a. Of a time of proposal, I mean that's like the most beautiful analogy I've ever heard of a time of worship. So that's it was really Thank good. You. Good job, Chris. I liked it. <laughs> it's just true. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Okay, so Bruce, do you want to answer that? Just quickly, uh, yeah. my style of worship is very non-public, just like Chris's. I can't, I can't be intimate with my God when there's chaos around me. I have to be. By myself in a room, and and that's and that's where I enjoy the most important times with him. Not that not that I can't express myself. There I am right now, in a public forum. It's just I have a, a, a stronger connection when things are quiet. Mm -hmm. The music I listen to has no words in it, because if it has words in it, I have to think about the words, and then that shuts me up. So my music is all. Mute, <laughs> no words, but that's what gets me connected. <laughs> but we, once we find out who we are in God, that's how we worship. Mm -hmm. I can't be in here, jump around like a maniac and worship God. That doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. Ninety-nine percent works for the people here. It doesn't work for me. Find out who you are, stick with that, and worship God with your whole heart, in truth and in spirit, yeah. and He'll pour back into you. Yeah. But don't be somebody who you're not. Yeah. yeah, that's so good. It's so good. It's a, and it's a good reminder too. You know, like 
anybody else's like judgment or opinion of you is not your right. problem. Right. <laughs> so if your worship looks different than theirs and they have an issue with it, don't worry about that. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but I like talk with my hands. <laughs> I don't think I would be able to speak if I didn't have arms. So I, <laughs> I, the, I express myself that way in worship, in talking, in arguing. <laughs> oh, you get me going. <laughs> my, I, I use my hands um, in expressing myself. And so that's part of it for me is my words of surrender have to include some sort of action of surrender, whatever that looks like, right? Like hand, hands in the air, <laughs> surrender. Um, and so I find I find a connection to the words of worship, of like the of praise and worship, when I also am physically experiencing that same thing. That's mm -hmm. that's me. Um, and also, there's something that's that's tied into that for me. That, and I, I know that some of you have felt the same thing. Tim has expressed this that because I know where I was and who how God has brought me to today, I can't help but to worship. Like I can't, I can't withhold that when I get the opportunity to. Um, and that again, now we're talking specifically about a time of praise and worship. Cause again, worship is a lifestyle, but in these moments when we're talking about an act of worship, um, I can't, I can't hold it back. I can't do it. I, I've been in places, I went to a church one time, the worship team, the, what they were doing was fabulous. It was like sheer excellence and I could feel, feel the spirit and no one else in the room was moving. They were just like, and I like couldn't contain myself. I was like, I don't care. I don't care. I can't not. Um, and so that's me. And, and that's, that's part of who I express myself as individually. Well, I just wanted to say that, you know, what we do up here and what you do in your daily can be different because I the reason I am on the worship team is because I feel like I'm a cheerleader. I want people to go in a place they haven't before. But in my home life and in my daily walk, I'm sorry, folks, I'm in his lap. That's where I live. Yeah. I live in that place where I don't have to be loud or anything. That's my worship. So it's okay to be different in different places. Yeah. Because a lot of people think, oh, the only way to worship is that way. No. And it is, you know, like Bruce, his is different. But you know what? I've seen you actually do stuff here that was different than what you're comfortable with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it isn't always just about being comfortable. That's true. Because I, the Holy Spirit challenged me on that one time too. I was like going and going, and he was like, you need to actually be still. <laughs> you actually just need to be still. And he was right. I needed to stop. So we can get into those, like, rituals, traditions, habits, and we lose touch with like what's right now. What is the spirit doing right now? Sometimes he wants you to stand and be still. And sometimes he wants you to get uncomfortable and move. You're right. <laughs> You're right. Right, Bruce? Right, Bruce? Right, Bruce? Oh, yes. <laughs> I think Don't Libby touched on this a little bit. When I first came in, to, it was years ago when I first went to a retreat and it did not attach to me at that point. And they started worshiping and holding their hands up and stuff. I thought, I'm in for some real trouble. Because <laughs> I thought it was way out there. And it, even for me to be up there is something that happened. Pastor Steve had kind of gave me a nudge up there. He bought me a guitar when I did not have one. And he kind of put me up on stage. And there were a few people in here, even while I had that guitar, that convinced me to just give it a shot. So I went up there, and I had no clue what was going to happen to me while I was going to be up there. <laughs> but what it has done for me is amazing. I, it really has. And, and I was fully against all of this arm raising and praising God stuff. I thought these guys are out of their minds for real. And it has done amazing things for me. Like I'll be up there, and then Levy mentioned it a little bit. Sometimes I don't want to be up there. I don't want to be the center of stage. I'm afraid. That I might take it too far and all of a sudden think that I'm doing really good up there. I do not want to be that guy. So it's a big responsibility, kind of. You, you get up there and you have people saying you're good. I, I don't like to hear that. But I've learned to say thank you. It, and it's about the heart that you have for God, I think. And to learn to separate it. I'm kind of glad I don't want to be up there 
because I never started playing guitar to be a rock star, to tell you the truth. But I love music. And to be able to worship him with it has been just a blessing for me and my family. It's pulled me into the love of these people because I probably wouldn't be here if I wasn't up there. And the other thing is I learned that it's not about me. It is about what, what Bruce said. It's about your heart and what God has done. It's really what God has done for me that comes out of me up there. Words of affirmation are a type of worship. Great job, Tim. It goes up here mm -hmm. and, you, and you, you blow yourself up. Good job, Tim. It goes down here. What do you do? You worship God. Yeah. It's how and how you take it and where it lands. Yeah. We're going to wrap up with this Psalm 150. And this is from the Amplified Version. I love the Amplified because it takes one word and it makes it seven. <laughs> <laughs> it says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to the abundance of his greatness. <laughs> Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with the harp and the lyre or the guitar. Praise him with a tambourine, a drum, and dancing. Praise him with stringed instru instruments like a violin and the flute. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Praise him with loud cymbals. Let everything that has breath, you, you breathe in? Let everything that has breath and every breath of life praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Well done, everybody. Thank you. See that the kids are starting to infiltrate. Right. So they're done. Infiltrate.